Welcome to another CEO Wisdom podcast with Michael Erickson Fatchin. Fatchin is well pronounced, Mike. Got it. Yeah. Cool. CEO at Ad Badger. Uh, they are doing Amazon PPC campaigns big time. Uh, it's a cool uh, agency. Love the logo. Love the name. Badgers are cool animals. We may talk about that today, but yeah, honored to talk to Mike today. This podcast is brought to you by podbuyer.com. That's my podcasting agency. If you want to start, scale, or be invited to podcasts like this one, find sponsors and monetize the crap out of your podcast. Most podcasts fail because the passion is there, but the money is not. And I help you get your ROE and ROI into the podcasting game. So podbuyer.com for that. Michael, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and Ad Badger. Yeah, um, a little bit about myself. So I started a PPC agency uh, maybe 12 years ago, and I was using a lot of advanced tools for Google ads and Facebook ads. And I was like, where are the advanced tools for Amazon ads? So in 2017, I embarked on a journey of creating my first SaaS, my first software, and uh, it's been an absolute roller coaster, awesome ride. Uh, here we are in 2023, still going strong. Uh, we've got about 1,200 ad accounts on our platform. We optimize about 2 million bids a day, uh, which is really cool to sort of be able to study that much data, create bidding algorithms for that much data, interact with really sharp Amazon marketers and successful entrepreneurs in the e-commerce space think about features and how to prioritize them and how to build them. And what's cool about software is you really get to like talk to people in the industry, like see what's going on in other tools too, like even outside of the Amazon ad space and sort of get inspired by different kinds of software features and ways to analyze data and automations to do and weave that into a platform that's helpful for Amazon sellers. It's been really really exciting. It, it constantly keeps me awake and keeps me going. So let's start with the basic. Is it fair to say that 90% of cases you're better off starting an Amazon agency rather than having an Amazon store? Yeah. If there's someone who's, who's not doing anything, you know, they're, they're thinking about, you know, they want to be in the space how do they be in the space? I will say that my experience is, you know, it's easier to sell shovels in a gold rush, right? Instead of like going and getting the actual goal. So what I what I can say is like, there's a definitive need for e-commerce stores to go and get help with marketing their product. That's a real need. Uh, getting a product right, like thinking of great product market fit, running an e-commerce business is has that unknown variable of like, will people want what I'm selling? And it's possible that you miss that as an e-commerce entrepreneur. But if you sell something that you know, there's a known demand for, then I think you'll be in a much better position. Then is it better to start a SaaS related to Amazon ads rather than an agency? You know, I saw a quote this quote was maybe 10 years ago. It was like, every company is a software company. They just don't know it. So even if you are just a freelancer or just an agency, software should still be fueling a lot of what it is that you do. So like, you know, we're using Zoom, you know, you use Google Workspace, you use Google Drive, you know, you might have tools that manage your clients' campaigns. So, you know, using tools, being very heavily reliant on tools, you know, there's an argument there that every company is a software company. Um, but in terms of building a SaaS, no, I, I w w confidently say that is not easier than starting an agency. Right. It's tricky. Uh, lots of upfront investment, lots of things that go wrong that break and you're not seeing your dollar up until like year four or five. Uh, then you, the cool thing, obviously, the, is that in the best of scenario, it sort of scales by itself. The customer refer one another. Most of it is automatized. And the best part is just like real estate. You can sell uh, the full business for millions. Uh, is that accurate? To add a caveat to that, you know, uh, Amazon ads is a space that it's constantly evolving. So that upfront investment of like, I'm going to spend 
engineering dollars and engineering time to build a feature and then get an ROI from it. So like sell the feature later, uh, that is constantly happening. So, you know, it's, we, we are looking constantly looking for ways to increase engineering output, not reduce it. Cause like, there's always a new feature, like the list of our backlog still has like 300 things in it of things to build. So like, it, and that's what I was mentioning too. It's like so exciting to be in a space where there are so many ideas. Although I do fantasize sometimes I'm like, man, should we have just created an invoice tool where like you just type in how much somebody owes you and that sends them an invoice and it's it. Your backlog is like two things. And then maybe you could realize that. But I think uh, for us and everyone on the team, like we're excited by constantly thinking of new features and building new features for sure. What Jeff Bezos mental model have you adopted as a CEO so far? I think he's always been pretty frugal. Um, I love the idea of like, it's always day one like never get complacent. I think the times in my entrepreneurial career where I've been most unsatisfied and like most restless or most anxious or most depressed, it's where I was almost like sitting back, resting on my laurels. And like, I'm just like, ah, let me coast a little bit. I've been working so hard. Like, you know, we've gotten so far further than we thought we would. Now maybe I can relax. And like, then things start to, you know, you start to miss opportunity. You start to sort of go and slow and relatively slow. So like having that hunger to like always be moving forward, it's always day one, I think is a something that really resonates with me. Yeah. What badger philosophy do you have in you? Mm. That's a good one. I think that uh, for me personally, one thing I love to do is exercise, specifically running. And the reason why it's because it's, you really have to conquer just yourself. Um, you know, maybe in boxing, you're almost like trying to conquer the other person, but with like running, it's just you out there. And that sort of like mental toughness is something that really resonates. Like if you've seen the video of the, the badger, who's like running into a beehive to get the honey uh, or the badgers like snarling at some lions or the ba badgers like wrestling with a poisonous snake and gets bit by the venom and then keeps on, keeps on kicking even after he wakes up uh, that kind of thing. Like that sort of tenacity that like never say die. That's uh, that's written on my heart for sure. Sort of pivoting back because I remembered one question I was about to ask you. Um, software is eating the world. Uh, is AI eating software? You know what? I think it's really interesting. Uh, I was listening to, I believe, Saster podcast, which is a cool podcast about software, B2B software. And there was a quote that said at some investment firm, like 90% of the things that they were investing in had AI written somewhere on the software and they're like, awesome. And then the question was, well, for those tools, how do they use AI? And it's almost like not every tool can benefit from plugging into an LLM, like plugging, basically plugging into the chat GPT API. What does that actually get you? So, you know, do we, so for our, for our cases, you know, we optimize millions of bids every day using an algorithm that we baked in, you know, LLMs are not great at math and like, maybe they will get better one day, but like our, our algorithm currently takes in a lot of data and it processes it in a way that, you know, algorithms can be benefited by AI too. But I think, I think there's definitely a trend right now to just put, AI everywhere without a real thoughtful consideration to like, does it actually make the thing better just yet? So like the actual, like every tool is like saying it's an AI tool now, but I also think that sometimes it's sort of BS, like it's just like marketing speak. Um, I do think it has a lot of cases. Uh, is AI eating software? I, you know, I think <laughs> yeah. that 
software eating the world is sort of false. What is eating, right? It's me consuming something and that thing sort of disappearing or dying or, be, or being recycled to me because I'm going to grab it at the other end. And it's a never ending cycle, but it implies that I take something from something sort of win lose, right? So I don't think software is eating the world. I think software is aggregating to the world. And AI, well, I, I think AI will use so software like a maestro of an orchestra, you know? So mm -hmm. and it's just going to multiply things. Um, is it going to multiply evil? I think like good and evil are, are, are always going to equilibrate one another. I think I don't think the world is getting worse. It is accelerating, but I don't think we're heading down a uh, negative road. I, I do see lots of good things with AI. And obviously I'm privileged, you're privileged. Um, I'm gonna get super ultra rich from that and that hopefully I, I, will, I will be able to give back um, from my gains and, and go win-win. Um, what are your objectives with the Amazon agency? You have the SaaS, you know, you're quite ambitious. What are your top three goals uh, for 2024? Uh, I think the thing that really excites me like building a really great team culture. Uh, that's always been so exciting to me. Like that's part of the reason why I'm not just a solo preneur person. Like I really do like to build a community. And even though we're in like the Amazon advertising space or like the Google ad space with the, uh, my agency or with the software, I do think it's really nice to do some good. So like treat people well, treat our customers well, like help people even who are not our customers through our content marketing. Uh, that's always been very, very exciting to me. Um, that, that's one goal I have. I have I have more specific goals. Like uh, I have an agency search scientists uh, and there I'm hoping to build out more of a full service thing. I have lots of features that I want to build into AdBadger, uh, the software tool. Um, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a bunch of stuff, uh, like specific things. Um, but in general, I always try to set a minimum growth goal of of twenty five percent a year. What products are exploding on Amazon, and in what market? I see a lot. I see a lot of different products. I will say that I think the days of doing anything on Amazon and having it become a full time living for cheap are is sort of over. I would say Amazon really wants. I don't think it matters what product you have. Because I think if you do these things that I'm about to say, like you will find some degree of success. And that is basically, if you're trying to build a real brand, like can your brand, can your company exist on Amazon and off of Amazon? Like if, if the answer is yes, I think you're going to find a good degree of success. Meaning if you look at the things the best e-commerce brands do, it's like they have social, they invest a lot in their product market fit. They do like they're they're very aware of who their industry is and what that industry is looking for experts at branding experts at understanding their product their market and experts at the data so like understanding what works and what doesn't very quickly those people will find success no matter what they're selling um so i'm i'm, I'm hesitant to say like a specific niche because i think within that niche you could be selling in that niche and just be playing money ball. Like, oh, this is a niche that might have some opportunity. I'm going to sell in it. That's super, that's going to be super short term, even if you catch it, because eventually you'll be boxed out by the people that like invest in the brand that like build product videos and take great product photography and like do those things and understand the database ROI on those things. Like those are the people that have the easiest time on Amazon that never stop investing in their product and serving their market doesn't matter what they're selling. Right. My brain also picked back on a piece of data you mentioned previously, and that's cruising. I was listening to a podcast yesterday of Patrick Bet David with Bradley, and Bradley was mentioning that he was cruising. Bradley's quite successful, uh, DECA millionaire, uh, but PBD is a Sentai millionaire, a pretty impressive guy. And PBD just got his new book out, which is called uh, Choose Your Enemies Carefully, which is interesting. Mm. Do you believe in the power of having enemies um, or anger to uh, avoid complacency and uh, not staying in the stagnant zone? Hmm. 
Hmm. Using that as a as a force, you know, I pay very little attention to competition. Uh, to me, I have a vision in my head of who I'm serving and how I'm serving them. And competitors to me are a little bit of a distraction. It's almost like turning around and looking backwards uh, instead of forward. So I have a place in my head that I'm really trying to get to. Um, and like that fuels 99% of my time. Now it's impossible to not see competitors and be aware of what's going on. I mean, there's just a, a pragmatic paying attention to the industry, but I don't hate those. I don't hate those people or consider them enemies. <laughs> um, and I know that's not what you were asking, but to, to me, no, I, I have a positive place that I'm trying to get to, uh, not necessarily being pushed, pushed by a negative thing. I want to be, I'm trying to get pulled. I'm trying to run towards a positive thing. I think for me, what about you? That's interesting. That's a great question. It's definitely not the the dominant thing. I don't think about my haters when I wake up. I'm a <laughs> yeah. generally happy dog. I'm like a pit bull, but I, I bite, you know, and I, I love chasing praise. Um, so I have that aspect to me, that testosterone aspect to me. So it's, I, I will use it sometimes. I will choose my battle. I, I don't fight wars other than if it's in my terrain, right? And if the enemy has like 0.1% chance of winning. Um, and yeah, haters is like a losing ground, right? Like they're, they're... It's more about them than it is you. Yeah, it's ants, you know? Uh, even an army of ants won't do much to that lion, let's say. So you don't want to squish an ant, you know? Let the poor thing live and do its thing. So, and I, I do also understand haters, you know? Like their anger, because I'm a human too. And so, but yeah, I will sometimes use it as a motivator, you know? Um, when I get these crap responses from the cold email I send, you know, people saying I'm an idiot and... So, some things like that because I get the both the both ends you know like positive and negative so that's you know, I, I really love the quote living well is the best revenge so like the uh -huh. best way to deal with a hater is to you know not hate them back to yeah. let them let them hate on even higher levels of your success you know mm -hmm. hey they, they will be punished they, they, they will uh, fall under their own weight of their own hatred Right. Yeah, I have such a good life. I do impose a lot of stress on myself, though. I think uh, I love it that way for, for growth. Do you also put a lot of stress and risk on your plate nowadays? Or I would definitely say there's stress is definitely something that pulls me, um, where it's like, I'm worried about getting a feature out in time. I'm worried about satisfying a customer. I'm worried about the changing landscape um, of digital marketing out there. So I, I'm definitely worried about all those things no doubt about it and do you feel that because i throw so much stress on my plate that through sheer exposure and this is, is the same thing with haters you know like i just got accustomed to it at first it was not cool but i feel nowadays it, it pulls me in the right direction and it motivates me if there's no stress I don't feel there's growth and i feel i won't be achieving the life that i set for myself so it's no longer an, a happiness question, but an achievement because I've done the happiness game. You know, I maxed it out at 18, uh, drinking booze and going after bitches and parties and, and all of that. So I maxed that one out. And nowadays I feel it's more like achievement. Yes, there's still happiness. I'm still happy dog, like I mentioned, but it's mostly accomplishment. What, what do you think about that? I think uh, it's part of most humans psychology to want progressive challenges you know just like playing a video game like you beat one level the next level is a little bit harder and that keeps you engaged or you know you play music and you learn one song that's easy you want to go on to another one that's a little bit more difficult so i think that's baked into every single human that's definitely like it's the reason why you know humanity has progressed for sure and you play music, you love memes, you're like a multifaceted <laughs> guy, somewhat creative. How do you merge all of this together with your existing business? I think one thing is to never, like, never take myself too seriously. Uh, that's another thing that I think will add destructive stress, you know, where you take yourself very seriously and you need things to be perfect in order for you to be satisfied and you need to be treated a certain way by other people in order to 
uh, validate your own identity. Like when those things are, when you're taking yourself so seriously, like how come this client won't sign? Like, don't they know how serious I am and all this stuff? Having a lot of levity and lightness and silliness to remind myself like, hey, everything's fine. Like, you know, you're okay. And like, have some fun along the way. Uh, you know, if you can make work more like play, like be playful and uh, turn things into, you know, like we, we play guitar, but we're like, we go to, we like, we work at the computer and it's like, it, it is kind of like a game in a lot of ways. Like there, you know, there's inputs, there's outputs. You're like looking at, to use a video game analogy. It's like, you know, who's the enemy, what kind of spell or what kind of magical weapon do you need to use to slay the enemy? It's like the same thing with like, I don't know, doing a lead generation campaign or something. So it's a similar set of components, but the labels are different. What's your relationship with highs and lows? For example, this year started low. I hustled a bunch for like six months and now I'm riding high, you know? Yeah, like, same, so, same. So it's like, what's your relationship? Me, I, I love the fucking hustle. I love to be almost broke, you know, and, you know, back to to almost square, square one. Yeah. And, and just like, yeah, it's Tim Ferriss, you know, like he sleeps on the floor sometimes with a can of beans, you know? Uh, I also like that, you know, I love being at the top of the mountain but i also like climbing it sweating like a pig and being in, in total pain cave yeah same uh in fact a, a lot of times so I'm, I'm actually trying to break myself out of this habit because what will happen is like things will be not good i'll kick it into high gear things will be good and then i relax i sort of i mentioned it earlier i begin to i begin to rest and then problems happen again and then i kick into high gear I'm trying to get to a point where I can stay in high gear or remodel what it means to be in high gear. So like get into high gear, deploy a bunch of systems, get a bunch of stuff done and then install systems so that all those activities are still going and then I can relax, but but have that level of output, even though I'm not manually doing it. So I'm really trying to engineer my mind into like, as a CEO, my big thing is to go i'm like i'm the one at the company who's going to be the best fastest i should be the best and fastest at like trying something new hey have we done this with our pricing like what about this onboarding sequence like how come we don't use this tool uh to generate leads like what about this what about that the faster i can do those things and then turn that into a system that someone else can do or we hire someone else just like we build the tower that way by like adding more engines to the the vehicle that we're in just adding like you know turn it from a v v6 to a v8 type thing like that's how we get faster we talked about the exposure i think it's definitely a way to get their systems you know um, improving your brain can be another one talking about that how do you make sure to improve your brain whether it's biohacking taking care of yourself and and your body well i i had a kid I had a little baby a couple months ago. So I would say that I've never slept worse than I am right now. So I, it's funny. I have a lot of friends who are biohacking and doing sleep optimization. And I, I'm just like, man, I'm just trying to make it through the day. Um, so the thing that I do right now that I, that is super helpful, uh, really strategic about caffeine. Uh, so like a certain amount of caffeine every few hours during the workday, uh, resetting my caffeine tolerance over the weekend. So note that means no caffeine on the weekend. That way I never become unaccustomed to it. Uh, that way I never get too uh, desensitized and it has no effect. So I'm really intentional about my caffeine intake, when I'm taking it, how much, being sure to go on a caffeine break over the weekend. So that way, Monday through Friday, you know, I work a pretty typical schedule. It's like I'm using it really strategically. So that's been really great. We're about to have kids and the, the nanny to me seems like I, I, I cannot go without the nanny because I'm willing to sacrifice sleep, but it seems extreme, uh, especially in the, the first months. Uh, what do you think about the nanny plan? I think that uh, I am, I consider myself super lucky that I'm not a single parent. I do have a wife uh, and I will say that even that, even to have two dedicated sharp people it's still not enough i think 
if you don't have family nearby, if you can't hand off the baby to a grandparent or a brother or a sister or whatever for several, for at least four hours a day, you need help. Uh, so I think everyone, if you, you know, and again, super privileged, there's so many parents that are single parents raising multiple kids in my, I cannot imagine how difficult that is. Um, but I think on an under an ideal scenario, you get as much help as you possibly can. It's like, you know, you're to use business terms. It's like you're investing in the baby. Why wouldn't you want to invest as much as possible? So I think if you have the means, then it is a true blessing and do it. Yeah, for sure. The insight I got from that also is to make more friends in this community. For example, right now I'm in Oaxaca, right? An easy move for me would be to go back to Uganda. And for example, I don't know, buy property near my brother and his his wife and my family and so forth. So, but I think here, yeah, first it's beautiful. It's really nice. We have family, obviously, but if you can have a community and you know when they're three well not three but when they're like five year old they can go play at, at the friend's house you know that also have children so yep. seems like a, a good strategy as well so thank you for that one uh where can people find out more about you michael uh i spent a good amount of time on linkedin you can send me a message on linkedin uh michael erickson fashin f-a-c-c-h-i-n uh, that's actually the the Americanized pronunciation. You actually had it correctly with the Italian pronunciation earlier. Um, and adbadger.com, searchscientists.com. Uh, I do a lot of stuff in the digital marketing space. Uh, great, to, great podcast. Great questions. Thank you, dude.